Hello, everyone. Welcome to my channel. Thank you guys for being here. It is so good to see you guys. I know it has been a while since I have been live or really posted anything. If you've followed my channel for a while, you guys know I kind of disappear for a little bit. Um, but I am back and I wanted to talk about a few things going on in the Idaho case. I know we've all been following it closely. Again, understand there is a gag order, so we're not going to learn a whole lot. But since my little break, there have been some things that came out that I do want to share here. Um, another article I found with an interview um, with a neighbor, just some interesting things that Koberger allegedly said to him. So we're going to go over that. Obviously, I want to talk about the Ann Taylor possible conflict. I'm not going to spend too much time on that just because I feel like you know, that's been discussed quite a bit. It's nothing really that is, um, I don't know, it's interesting, but it will be interesting to see what happens with it. But I have heard, you know, different attorneys, different legal experts, etc. A lot of people have different opinions on if there is a conflict, if there's not a conflict. So again, it's going to be interesting to see. And I'll definitely share with you guys when and if anything else comes out about that. Like Will Ann Taylor be off Brian Koberger's case? Is she going to stay on? What's going to happen with that? So we'll talk about that a little bit, but not for too long. So that's kind of what we're going to do today. I also want to look at that airmail article part two. So we'll go over that. Um, but I'm quickly going to say hey to everybody. Hello, Pierre81, Heather, Adam. I see insanely confused. You said you need to take breaks too. Yeah, it's good to take a break every now and again. Now and then. Hey, Shay, Adrian, Ossane, Reagan, Heather, Queen Olive. I love olives, <laughs> if that's what your name is from or if it's from your name, but I do like olives. Um, Amanda, Lames Bond, and just anybody I miss, BJ, everybody coming in, or BG, Agape Love, Sherry, Megan, Jax. Mel Mac. Yeah, thank you to all my mods. True Karma Shannon. Hello. It's so good to see you guys. So let's just kind of get right into this. Shay says, I love olives too. I like all kinds of different olives. Vanessa, Kathy L, Chicken Noodle Girl. All right. So we're going to start with the Ann Taylor stuff. And like I said, I'm just going to kind of go to an article. So we know that Zana's mother did an interview with Ashley Banfield. I'm not going to play it. I know a lot of people have different opinions on it, but I obviously watched it. She is um, very upset that her public defender, Ann Taylor, um, is now representing Brian Koberger. Ann Taylor recused, recused herself from Kara's case, Kara is Zana's mother, on January 5th, the same day that Koberger arrived to Idaho after being extradited from Pennsylvania. So again, I have followed um, different legal experts, attorneys, read different articles, and the opinions seem like they are all over the board. Some people think that it is um, very, you know, in, uh, unprofessional. Some people think it's a conflict. And then if Ann Taylor, you know, stays on the case the entire time, Koberger could get his possible conviction overturned with appeals. So again, it's going to be interesting to see what happens um, as the days goes on. So far, you know, there's been no comments. There's obviously the gag order, but I do kind of feel like, I don't know, I'll be surprised if Ann Taylor stays as Brian's attorney, but we'll see. And not only did she represent Zana's mother, she also represented Maddie Mogan's father, his name is Benjamin, and then she also represented Maddie Mogan's stepmother. Not sure of her name. So there's three parents of the victims who Ann Taylor had represented. Again, though, she's a public defender, and that's where I feel like the opinions of these legal experts kind of get wishy-washy because she's not a private attorney. She is a public defender. So we're just going to quickly kind of go through this article. This is from I think the Independent, and I thought it was a good article. Yeah, that was, um, Heather, I think, yeah, it was prior to February, or I'm sorry, prior 
to January 5th that she was there. Like she was already there before Koberger was even back in Idaho. So yeah, I've heard some different things on that too, True Crime with Shannon. But yeah, bottom line, if this is going to be a death penalty case, like it is looking like it will be, she is one of the only ones who can defend him. I've again seen a few different things about that, but I've heard there's about 13 that they they could choose from. Then I've also heard there's only two. So again, it just seems so unclear. And I just really feel like you would think like the judge would have already had this all squared away, but I don't know. So we're just going to quickly kind of go through some of this. Okay, so Koberger attorney represented parent and victim in Moscow homicides before taking his case. So she withdrew from Kara's case, Zana's mother, on January 5th, the same day Koberger made his first court appearance in Lataw County. The parent was previously sentenced on unrelated misdemeanor charges. Now, Kara also said in her interview with Banfield that um, Ann Taylor had power of attorney and that she had not heard from anybody from the public defender's office about, you know, where like what to do next or whatever. But she also apparently was on, um, was wanted for a warrant. She didn't appear for court, so they had a warrant out for her. So again, I don't know what's going on with all that. I feel, I feel for Zana's mother. Um, I really do. She seems, you know, she's in addiction, in my opinion. That is a ter terrible disease. I don't want to get into that debate, but she's very sick in my opinion. And that interview is just hard to watch. So legal experts said the new detail in the high profile case raised conflict of interest questions when presented with the information by the Idaho statesman. So anytime a forum, former client is involved in a current representation, a lawyer should evaluate any potential conflicts. Conflicts are very factually based, and so the lawyer decides whether the lawyer has a conflict. And one thing that I did find interesting, according to Banfield, the paperwork, so Kara, I think now she goes by Kara Northington, but according to Banfield, it did state Kara Kernodal on her identifying paperwork. So again, according to Banfield, she was saying that with that last name, not a very common last name, Ann Taylor should have known immediately that, you know, this accused killer, Brian Koberger, one of his victims, Anna Kernodal, was likely related to Kara. So again, just interesting when thinking about the whole totality of the case, the justice process, the justice system, what, if anything, is going to happen with this? Okay, so here's where it states, Taylor is one of just 13 public defenders in Idaho approved by the state's Public Defense Commission to lead a capital punishment case. She also is the only one in all of North Idaho. Prosecutors have yet to indicate whether they will seek the death penalty in Koberger's case. Now, another thing that I thought was interesting that came out in Kara's interviews is she did not seem like she was pro-death penalty. We know that Kaylee's family, the Gonsalveses, have said that they absolutely would support the death penalty for Koberger, but Kara, Zana's mother, did not seem in support of the death penalty. So again, when thinking about the four victims, I don't know how Idaho works, but I know in many states they take the victim's family's request into consideration when deciding to go for the death penalty. Um, so with having four different victims, I just really wonder like if they'll take that into consideration when, you know, deciding to pursue the death penalty or not against Brian Koberger. Yeah, the co-defendant's wording in the legal paperwork is just legal wording. There is no co-defendant. I have heard the same thing, Jesse Lynn, um, that many of these experts, whatever, have stated that that is just pretty standard language. But of course, with people knowing so little facts about this case, with Koberger stating 
have you or was anybody else arrested yet or whatever he stated, people are kind of, you know, running with that and wondering more about that. But I've heard the same, that it's just a legal kind of thing they always put in there. Um, hey, Ava. Ava says public defenders, but there is a list of private attorneys pre-approved by Idaho's PD that qualify. So again, I'm just very curious if by the time, you know, we get to even the June 26, when the preliminary hearing is set to begin, and then obviously the further this goes, if Ann Taylor is going to stay the attorney the entire time. I'm just curious to see how that's gonna, going to play out. Because she, again, has represented three of the victim's parents. Zana's mother, Madison Mogan's father, and Madison Mogan's stepmother. So Taylor's office has represented another parent of a Moscow victim in four criminal cases since she became the chief public defender. In two cases, online court records named Taylor as an inactive attorney. Then it goes on about her education. So this legal expert says potential conflict is not easy to answer, which I feel like we're seeing a theme of that among the professionals and the experts are seem very split on this. Um, So this guy is saying loyalty and independent judgment are essential elements in the lawyer's relationship to a client. Concurrent conflicts of interest can arise from the lawyer's responsibilities to another client, a former client, or a third person, or from the lawyer's own interests. He declined to state whether Taylor's situation constituted a conflict of interest, instead saying that lawyers should be guided by their state codes and even consult others in the practice when possible conflicts arise. So she, again, she may have done that. She may have gone to the judge and had this okayed. We're just not privy to that information. Okay, so I'm going to kind of move on from that. I just, again, find it interesting that out of the four victims, you know, two, Maddie and Zana had parents and a stepmother who were represented by the same attorney, um, the same public defender who's now representing their accused killer. Yeah, I'm sure she will have to drop. Yes. And again, I don't think she's the only one qualified, but she did drop. She was actively on Kara's case, Zana's mother, and she did um, drop her case. January 5th, the same day that Koberger uh, returned from Pennsylvania back to Idaho. And then I do have that picture. I think it has the date where she's at the house with the other woman who is filming. Let's see. And it was before February 5th. Yeah, so this was January 3rd. Ann Taylor and a team of investigators for the defense were seen at the house examining evidence that remained behind weeks after police carried out the victim's belongings. Which I don't think police carried out the four victims who were killed, but they took out things from the roommates. But then after the defense, we do know they removed like the, those mattresses and some furniture and stuff. So anyway, I know people think it's frustrating that she's here January 3rd while she was still actively, you know, the public defender for Zana's mother. And she did not withdraw from her case until January 5th. Right. Yeah, she is. And again, she's allegedly when she did the interview with Banfield, she was in a car Allegedly, she was on the run at that time. So again, I don't want to get into too much of that, but just a sad situation all the way around. And hey, Valerie, and I saw ATS News. Just welcome to everybody coming in. It's so good to see you guys. Okay, so I quickly want to go over... Before we do the airmail article, 
I want to share this because this I had not seen until today when I was looking for something else. I stumbled on this and I just hadn't heard it before. So I want to share this again. This is just allegedly what a neighbor of Brian Koberger shared. This is from MSN. Let me take this down. Um, IMO stands for In My Opinion. Yes, thank you, Shay. Yeah, Real Plant Diary says potential for a conflict. We need justice for victims. And that's kind of what Banfield, Ashley Banfield was saying. Like, in something this a high stakes, this is a very high stakes case. There's four victims here. Um, you just don't want anything that could possibly be grounds for an appeal or anything like that down the road. So I just really think it, um, I, it will not surprise me if we hear that, you know, Brian's getting a new public defender. I kind of doubt they're ever going to get him a private attorney unless one maybe does it pro bono. From what we know about his family's financial situation, the father, um, or I guess the family, whatever, has filed for bankruptcy twice that we know of. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Okay, so we have heard this from Nancy Grace, Brian Koberger's neighbor, says the murder suspect once told him the Idaho killing seemed like a crime of passion. And I could not find a date on this article, but again, it is from MSN. So these were the two things that I had not heard of. There's this one. So he claims that Koberger also said that serial killers are rare when talking about Netflix's new Jeffrey Dahmer miniseries. So remember, they Netflix put out a miniseries with Jeffrey Dahmer, in my opinion, it was very well done, very, you know, factual um, and extremely, you know, unsettling to watch. But it makes you wonder, did Brian Koberger watch the Dahmer series on his, you know, campus housing? Was he up in his, you know, apartment watching the Dahmer series before or after the homicides. I don't know. Just really interesting that um, they spoke allegedly, you know, about the Dahmer miniseries and Koberger stated, he said that serial killers are rare. And then, of course, that he also said the incident seemed like a crime of passion. And we talked about how the mayor used the term crime of passion and then he kind of walked that back a little bit, but very early on, the mayor was saying it seemed like a possible crime of passion. Yeah, you guys are saying we all watched it. Of course he did. I know, agape love. I know. Okay, Shay. And hey, Florida Bass Fishing. Good to see you. So I don't know. I just hadn't heard that one. I found it interesting. And then... Yeah, I guess this is the same neighbor. He brought up in conversation, asked if I had heard about the murders. Okay, here's a little more. In another conversation, the neighbor told CBS Mornings that Koberger asked if he had watched Netflix's Dahmer Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story, a limited series that tells the story of a notorious serial killer's life. He said that in that conversation, Koberger mentioned how rare serial killers are. The neighbor recalled a third conversation in which Koberger asked whether he'd be able to kill someone as a member of the military. So that part I hadn't heard either. I had heard the crime of passion that, you know, Koberger had said to the neighbor, it seems like they have no leads and they're calling it a crime of passion. But I had not heard that Koberger allegedly brought up the Jeffrey Dahmer's, the Jeffrey Dahmer miniseries and noted that serial killers are rare. And that he also allegedly asked him whether he would be able to kill someone as a member of the military. Remember, Koberger, wasn't he in some military program in high school? 
So just interesting that he allegedly said that. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree. It seems it's very interesting. And just, it makes you like, yeah, here's this picture of Koberger. Maybe in some ROTC program. And now I'm trying to remember, have we heard anything? Did Koberger ever, I don't think, I'm just thinking out loud. Did he ever try to join the military or anything? Okay, yeah, ROTC. So, you know, again, I'm guessing this neighbor, the way this sounds. Okay, thank you, ATS News. He wanted to join the Army Rangers. Interesting. Can't help to think, again, thinking out loud, say, you know, you have these thoughts, like homicidal thoughts in your head. Would the military be somewhere you would go or at least try to go in order to um, kill in kind of a legal way, if you will? Okay, yeah, the visual snow aspect. Now, I know a lot of people talk about that Crime Circus channel. I did watch a video this morning from Crime Circus, and he had, like, filters on the video that he claimed would show you what it looks like to have visual snow. And he said a lot of his, you know, comments, people were commenting that they do suffer from visual snow. And that it absolutely does impact your life. Like you get headaches, uh, migraines, you hear ringing in your ear, you don't have good peripheral vision, you view things like with kind of like a static like look. So just really interesting. Okay, thank you. Junior ROTC is high school and ROTC is college. Gotcha. And you said ROTC is high school here. So maybe it's just different. But anyway, so apparently, if this is true, what the neighbor told CBS, his neighbor must have been in the military, and Brian Koberger asked him whether he would be able to kill someone as a member of the military. So that was just interesting to me, the Dahmer conversation, which again, isolated, like watching Jeffrey Dahmer or watching the Jeffrey Dahmer miniseries, like whatever. Like I said, I watched it. I'm certainly not a homicidal person. I don't have those thoughts or anything like that. But just interesting to like now think of Brian Koberger and what he has been accused of up there watching the Dahmer, uh, the Dahmer series and then talking about it to his neighbor. Interesting. Electra says visual snow is his description of psychosis, I believe. And hello, Heavenly Clouds, Shannon. Interesting. Amanda says, I have visual snow and never knew it was different. So... Again, it's going to be interesting to see once we finally get to trial, which again, I think will be years away, but um, will we hear and see this same neighbor on the stand and will either side, you know, bring this up and are these conversations going to be talked about in trial? So I honestly have not seen any proof that he had visual snow other than those writings that I believe occurred between like 2009 to 2011, where he wrote about the visual snow. But beyond that, I mean, no. And again, we're obviously not privy to his medical records. Exactly. Yeah, we are not privy to any of his medical records. But I do wonder if, you know, his parents sought treatment for any of that. Like, my daughter has some eye issues, and we've been to the eye doctor. I mean, this will be our third time <laughs> within, like, six months. We're going Thursday. But anyway, I it will be interesting to see um, what, if anything, is true about the whole visual snow thing. And then a lot of people factor that into 
you know, Dylan, the roommate who, according to the affidavit, saw Brian Koberger walking towards her. He had a mask that covered his nose and mouth, and she noted that he had bushy eyebrows. People have debated, did Brian Koberger see Dylan? And she either, number one, wasn't a target. Number two, he was too exhausted to do anything, and he just left. Or did he not see her at all? So, yeah, Leslie says, I wonder if he ever mentioned that to his sister. Yeah, he has two sisters, so I wonder that as well. Um, hey, Cryptician, good to see you. Okay, so Electra says, I don't think visual snow is a diagnosis in the medical community. That was his description. Maybe I should ask the eye doctor about it Thursday because we're going to the eye doctor. Like I said, I can say, hey, have you ever heard of visual snow? But yeah, the courts are privy to his medical records. So we will see. And yes, Valerie Knox does have a channel. Feel free to link your channel, Valerie, or if any of the mods want to link her channel. Go for it. And I personally, at this point, I do not think that he saw Dylan either. Jesse says, I don't think he saw her peeking out of her door. He was focused on getting the hell out of there. Thank God or she would have been number five. That's kind of where I'm at. I just really don't think that um, he saw her. But I also really wonder what else she has told law enforcement that just wasn't in the affidavit. In my opinion, there is much more that she probably stated that just they didn't feel the need to put in the affidavit yet. Yeah, you guys said definitely ask. I will. Yeah, and um, Heavenly Cloud says, I would think BK was so hyped up on adrenaline. He didn't see her, but yeah, no proof. So again, just interesting that this neighbor is claiming that Koberger brought up Dahmer. And this does not state if it was before or after the murders. Now, obviously, it seems like it was a crime of passion would be after the murders. But it just states in another conversation, the neighbor say, stated that Koberger had asked if he watched Dahmer. And I wonder if the neighbor said yes or no, like if the neighbor did watch the Dahmer series or not. I don't know why. I'm just curious. But it doesn't state if that conversation was before or after the homicides. Same with the third conversation in which Koberger asked whether he would be able to kill someone as a member of the military. But it's interesting how this article um, puts it kind of in order. So after the neighbor said he had heard about the killings, Koberger told him that it seems they have no leads. It seems like it was a crime of passion. Then it goes on in another conversation and then the neighbor recalled in a third conversation. So be interesting to see if that was before or after the homicides, the Dahmer, and then asking if he would be able to kill somebody. Hey, Tony. Tony says, I feel he could have been shocked at what he did and never noticed her. Yes. Especially if, um, especially if, say, you know, Ethan and Xana weren't necessarily part of who, who he was targeting. If he was just going for either Kaylee and or Maddie on the third floor. And then I know a lot of people theorize he came downstairs and possibly kind of ran into Xana in the kitchen if she was doing something with her DoorDash or whatever. And then he killed her because she saw him. So a lot of people think that, you know, unfortunately, Zana and Ethan were killed because there was a run in between Zana and Brian, possibly in the kitchen. And then that's why they were killed as well. I love Google Heavenly Clouds. Okay, I'm reading your comments. Interesting, Seabree. See, that's something I just have not done a lot of research on is the visual snow. Agree. Um, Leslie says, and her door opened to the inside, which made it harder for him to see her. Yes. Very true point. 
Okay, so this is another little tidbit I found. Um, I know we all have kind of thought like, did Brian Koberger have friends? Uh, was he, if you want to use the word, an incel? Did he ever have a girlfriend? Things like that. So, thank you so much, Krista. Okay, this was interesting to me. And then I'm going to play a little news clip that kind of goes back to this. So, um, asking to remain anonymous, the neighbor said Koberger was always alone. He added that he heard a woman at the apartment one time. So, I would just be interested to know... Um, obviously like who that woman was. I do think it's very possible that Brian did have a girlfriend or a, not necessarily in a remote romantic way, but a friend either who was a female or a male. I think it's possible Brian maybe did have some more friends and was more social than we think and that they've gone to police. They've talked to who they need to speak to and they're just being quiet because they're going to be a witness. So with that in mind, I want to go over to this report. This is from ITV News. And it mentions that he was in the company of an Asian girl, often laughing and joking. So I want to play this because, again, I hadn't heard this before, so I wanted to share it here. Yeah, see, Heavenly Cloud says, I think BK had a friendly relationship with a girl. I think it's very possible because, um, again, I also heard somewhere, and that's what I was saying to ATS News about, I need to get better about documenting my sources. I did it for a while and kind of slacked off. But there was somewhere that a neighbor had stated they saw Brian Koberger arriving back to the apartment complex with a female, and they got out of the car and parted ways. Then there was also a neighbor who stated that they heard a female in Brian Koberger's apartment and they could hear talking. And that goes along with the article I just showed you, that little tidbit. And now we have this. Um, so, hey, Jay. And I saw Allie79, K. Danielle. Yeah, you guys are saying I think so too. So, you know, it's just like, oh, he was such a loner, blah, blah, blah. But again, we know that he shared the office at um, WSU with, I think it was two other people. It was at least one other person, but I think two. They did not seize anything from that um, from that office when they did the search warrant. So I just really feel like um, it's very possible that he maybe had a girl who he was friendly with or just a girl who was his friend or even more male friends. Because again, we heard from that one neighbor who stated that he and his roommate had to start basically avoiding Brian because he was so talkative and that if you enter, you know, in if you came into contact with Brian, it would take away a lot of your time because Brian would just talk and talk and talk and ramble and tell these roundabout stories. So they found themselves either, you know, walking slower or faster in order to avoid Brian. So again, that tells me like he might not have been so quiet and such a loner as we may think he was. So again, I feel like in time, we're going to learn more about it. But Shelly, your comment made me laugh. And again, it's okay to make jokes. Sometimes true crime is filled with very heavy, sad topics. So comic relief every now and then is okay, in my opinion. Yeah, like the Bates Motel. <laughs> Psycho is such a good classic movie. Okay, so let me play this. Out here, acting normally. I spoke to one of Koberger's neighbors here at his university accommodation in Pullman. He didn't want to go on camera, but said he frequently saw Koberger in the company of an Asian girl, often laughing and joking. On the night of the murder, he saw him right out here acting normally. At high speed, they finally found an identical car here. 
real quick, can you guys hear that okay? I feel like you would be telling me if you can't, but um, yeah. And yeah, um, for now, I really don't want to get into the Asperger's or the autism again. I have two people in my family very close to me who are diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. I understand that now they don't diagnose it as that anymore. And when and if Brian Koberger is diagnosed with any type of autism spectrum disorder, we can discuss it. But until then, I just don't really want to go there. But, um, you know, I do have two people that are very close. And I, I feel like saying he may have that, that personally, to me, it doesn't feel like a knock against people with autism. I just feel like everybody's trying to make sense of this. The two people I know are not, well, one of them is not violent, never has been. But again, let's just leave that out of it until we know. Um, but yeah, I do, I, um, I see people bring that up quite a bit in this case and many other cases, like the Chris Watts case, that was a big debate. But um, for the purpose of this discussion, let's just not get into that for now. Exactly. Um, even if he has it, it doesn't equal evil 100% agree. Okay, so let's watch this one more time. Belonging to postgraduate student Brian Koberger. I spoke to one of Koberger's neighbours here at his university accommodation in Pullman. He didn't want to go on camera, but said he frequently saw Koberger in the company of an Asian girl, often laughing and joking. On the night of the murder, he saw him right out here acting normally. Analysis of mobile mask data showed Koberger's phone was... Okay, so that to me, very short, but very interesting, that he often saw him in the company of an Asian girl, you know, laughing and joking. I'm going to play it one more time. And then on the night of the murders, he saw him right out here, obviously in the parking lot, acting normally. Um, again, I wonder what time that was. I can't help, but, you know, I want to know <laughs> every single detail. Like, what it, what was Brian doing up until he left and headed towards Moscow, Idaho. Will we ever know some of that stuff? Maybe, maybe not. It'll be very interesting to see what the fire stick that they took shows, what the computer tower they took, what his phone is going to show. Because again, even if he deleted history, things like that, they can still get that. So see, Dr. Lipschitz says, sounds like he had a girlfriend. I think it's very possible and that whoever that girl, even if it wasn't like a steady girlfriend, maybe it was just a girl that he spent a lot of time with and they're just choosing to be very quiet. See, I agree. Jay says, um, it doesn't shock me that the girl doesn't want to come forward. Yep, I agree. I wouldn't want to. I was telling ATS News that before the live. Um, I think if I was dating or friendly with Brian Koberger, I wouldn't want to come forward personally, so mine probably would too, Amanda. <laughs> My phone history, yeah, it would make me look a little, a little crazy. Now that I'm not sure. I have seen people talking about that, that he didn't have a modem tower because he used the college Wi-Fi. I'm really not sure about that, Heather, but that's an interesting question. Because that was another thing I know Alex Erickson had said that she researched into her understanding the washer and dryers are shared. You know how at apartment complexes they'll often have washer and dryer units that you walk out to use. Now I do know some apartment complexes have the shared washer and dryers, but then you can also have an option of getting one in your apartment. But I've not seen any images of them like removing a washer or a dryer from his apartment. So yeah, Mary Rose says no router. Yeah, they did take a computer tower. So I don't know. And we're still obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, we're not going to know what the testing, the animal hair, all the possible hair strands, one hair strand, the stains, the dickies, tag, two Marshalls receipts, one Walmart receipt. We all want to know 
what that is. Now, there was also an interview with his Pennsylvania public defender, and he stated that he believes that the Pennsylvania search warrant for the parents' house and for Koberger's car could be released at the end of February, early March, because there's like a certain amount of days from when they do it that they are supposed to release it by. So he said he thinks that we will get that eventually. Mary Rose says router is in the building. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And I agree, Shelly. Um, we kind of talked about that earlier that um, his laptop was very likely with him when he traveled to Pennsylvania. So to my understanding, Marco, that I, all I had seen is he got like breaking and entering, but that was because he entered 1122 King Road without permission. So that's the breaking and entering charge. Okay, so I'm going to play this one more time. Belonging to postgraduate student Brian Koberger. I spoke to one of Koberger's neighbors here at his university accommodation in Pullman. He didn't want to go on camera, but said he frequently saw Koberger in the company of an Asian girl, often laughing and joking. On the night of the murder, he saw him right out here acting normally. Analysis of mobile mass data showed Koberger's phone was turned off around the time of the killings. It also showed he'd driven past the house late at night repeatedly. A car matching Koberger's was spotted four times, loitering around the murder scene for 51 minutes before heading off at high speed. It was then picked up on these back roads, again by cameras, heading towards Pullman, where he lived. See that report, how he said driving by the house many times. Like, we don't know for sure. Those, and that's the thing that people who kind of go towards the defense side state, like, is the prosecution going to really be able to hone in on the phone pings? Because remember in the affidavit, there was even one that stated after the homicides, his phone pinged off a of Moscow tower, but they do not believe the phone was in Moscow. So a lot of people are like, oh, that's going to be such a problem for the prosecution, blah, blah, blah. But I don't know. I think we just don't know for sure yet. Um. how and if the defense will be able to explain any of that away. Tom Inns says, a little speculation doesn't hurt as long as you are willing to have and expect a healthy argument for what you are speculating. People reach sometimes. I agree for sure. And thank you so much for the super chat, super chat Tom, and I really appreciate that. But yeah, I am all for um, going off of the facts and speculating coming up with theories, but yeah. Um, I agree. You think so? Social Butterfly says, oh, trust me, they have zeroed in on the exact location of those pings. I hope so. Hey, Amy. Um, hello, Texas Wild One. Good to see you. Okay, so this is another thing that came out since we last spoke. So Brian Koberger's defense receives hundreds of documents from prosecutors. So the discovery disclosures include nearly a thousand pages of documents, almost twice as many images and a video. So a lot of people are like, why was there only one video listed? And then some people think that that video within the one video has multiple videos, like it was all compressed into one video file or whatever, but there's more in there. So again, what that is, we don't know. Yeah, here's the felony burglar. I can't talk. Koberger is being held without bail on four counts of first degree murder and a felony burglary charge after allegedly entering an off-campus house around 4 a.m. 
and attacking the Idaho students. So let me see if this is what shows. Yeah, this is the response. And I think it's towards the end that mentions the pictures and the videos. Yeah, this is it. So. The pages are numbered 1 through 995. Audio, video, it looks like 1. And then photos, 1 through 1865 so this is the this this is the stuff that defense has handed over um their discovery so far to the prosecute or to the defense the prosecution gave this to the defense yeah that tells me they knew he went in to commit a felony yes Hey, Lu um, Lucia, good to see you. And just everybody coming in, Hawkeye, good to see you. Glad you guys stopped by. So, yeah, what is this? Very, very interesting. Yeah. And I think, what was the Chris Watts discovery? I know they redacted a lot of it. But I want to say it was, it was definitely over 2,000 pages, I feel. Now I got to go Google it. <laughs> but I, I think it's going to end up being longer than this. I mean, they're still very early on in this investigation. Okay, so the Watts discovery in the redacted form is 1,960 pages. But before they redacted the Watts discovery, it was over 2,000. Hey, Lily. But I don't know. I know a lot of people are worried a little bit about, I really just feel like there's no way, in my opinion, could be wrong, but I feel like they have more DNA evidence against Koberger than just his DNA on the button sheath of the knife. I really feel like there's got to be more in there that they just didn't include in the affidavit. Um, I'm also very curious about that um, doctor visit. Koberger kept his medical appointment. So that tells me it was previously scheduled. It wasn't like he scheduled it right after the homicides. It stated that, you know, he kept his medical appointment that, um, took place, I believe four days after the homicide and that the office manager remembered Koberger specifically because of how friendly and nice he was and that made him stand out to her so i can't help but wonder if he was overcompensating with his personality a little bit and did he have any injuries um i'll see you later riddler good to see you i'm glad that you were able to be here for a little bit and thank you again tom n i don't like when creators pretend they have all the right to speculate while others are not allowed then run down <laughs> said creators just seems butch yeah I hope I don't do that. I really am all for open mind, open minds, speculating and giving theories as long as it's, you know, based. It has a good basis and it's respectful. Hello, Vicki. Okay, so again, that's interesting that they have so far 995 pages looks like over 1800 photos and one video and i'm really anxious let's see what we can find about the pennsylvania search warrant I'll see if I can find that article. Well, here's this one that says, this is interesting, force was used when search warrant was executed at Coburger home. Now, one thing I think is interesting is how the 
um, FBI surveyed Koberger for those four days before the arrest. And they saw Koberger going out around like 4 a.m., very early hours in the morning to do the trash disposal. So it just makes me wonder with the hours that they chose to raid the Pennsylvania home, like I do wonder if in the back of their minds they thought maybe Koberger was awake. But again, I know they were watching, so they could have been able to like watch the light patterns possibly depending on what room he was in or whatever. I don't know. But I just think this is fascinating. I wonder if there's body cam from his arrest. I would love to watch that. But yeah, there were multiple windows that were broken, I believe, to gain access as well as multiple doors. And we saw the video, I think it was the Daily Mail who got it, that um, his father was cleaning up glass around the home. I just found that really sad. You know, I feel for the parents until it comes out. If they knew anything and they chose not to turn him in, my sympathy will be gone. <laughs> like the laundry is no sympathy for Chris and Roberta Laundry. But for now, you know, um, let's hope they didn't know anything. And thank you again, Tom N says, yeah, exactly. A good, respectful base. Yep, 100%. Okay, so let me see this about the warrant. Yeah, you're saying I believe they knew nothing. And that's something that the air mail, have you guys, we'll get there, not trying to get to all over the place, but the air mail article mentions, you know, that detour they took where they ended up in Colorado, which still to me is just so weird. Um, and it mentions a little bit about that. Yeah, here it is. So Koberger's Pennsylvania public defender, Jason Labar, told 69 News sealed search warrants unseal after 60 days from when they were signed unless a motion is filed earlier. That means that the search warrants for Koberger's parents' home may be unsealed at the end of February or early March. So I really want to know what, if anything, you know, they found there. Because I, I also feel like once he was stopped twice, and again, the, um, law enforcement is saying that those stops were just a coincidence, where at one point they had said that, no, the FBI had ordered those stops, then they backtracked on that. So that's another thing that's still up in the air. But I just feel like he had to have been kind of feeling like they were onto the onto him. And then knowing that he went in the surgical gloves, cleaned out the Elantra, and then, of course, put trash in his neighbor's bin is really telling. Yeah, this is the parents' house right here. So it would have been hard for them. I guess they could have been around the back. The, there's not leaves on the trees at this time of year. So yeah, Valerie says, I don't think both were coincidence. That would be a very big coincidence. You know, I do kind of feel like maybe they're just trying to kind of cover that fact up for right now. But okay, there was one thing I wanted to show you while talking about the Elantra. And this is something that I had talked about in my previous live. And Remember how on their cross-country trip, they stopped at a mechanic shop to get some service done on the Elantra. And I had told you guys that I saw a TikTok comment from either the alleged, alleged mechanic or somebody who was working in the mechanic shop while him and his father were there stating that he was going to, I think I used the word sell the car, but when I finally found it, it says getting rid of the car. So anyway, there's this TikTok. Here's the creator. I don't know if this is still up. I just found the screenshot. But from with two M's, 96. And he obviously had posted that, you know, Brian Koberger and his father were in the mechanic shop. And someone writes, was he nice? I hope you gave him excellent service. And 
he responds, he declined the recommendations because he was getting rid of the car soon. So I really wonder if that was Koberger's plan to, you know, have dad come out there, drive across country in Pennsylvania, get rid of the white Hyundai Elantra, and then, you know, head back to Pullman without the Elantra because they announced they were looking for the Elantra on December 7th. They did say 2011 to 2013. Brian's was a 2015. So I don't know. Just interesting if this is true. And I definitely think the witness or the mechanic and the people in that shop who interacted with them could be called as witnesses. Um, I believe that there was also some report where the mechanic or somebody working there stated that Koberger's dad almost seemed like he was kind of bragging that they had made that long journey. So just really interesting. So that is fair. <laughs> yeah. Eddie C says, in all fairness, many people lie when being upsold by mechanics. Yeah. It could just be like he was trying to offer him all this crap and Koberger's like, no, I'm getting rid of this car soon. I don't want it just to, just to shut him down, you know? So, yeah, Seabree says, not that it's significant, but using the words get rid of instead of sell. Yeah, it really makes you wonder. But I also can't help but wonder how much, if any, cleaning did Koberger do in Washington? I mean, are we going to find out that he was seen in his apartment cleaning the car. No neighbors so far have said that, but it could be neighbors have told police and not spoken out to the public. I think that's important. And I have to remind myself that as well, that while researching this case and seeing what everybody has said, I promise you there's a whole handful of people who have called in tips and who have talked to law enforcement who have not spoken to Nancy Grace or Banfield or any news media. They've spoken to police and police only, and they're reliable people who, you know, interacted with Brian or who witnessed something about Brian, but we just aren't privy to it quite yet. So I really wonder if we're going to hear that he was seen on car wash cameras anywhere in Washington or, or you know, Idaho before Pennsylvania. What I'm told by the law enforcement source is that Kohlberger comes out a number of times. He cleans the car um, extensively, almost as if, you know, you were going to clean it to sell it as a new car, inside, outside, every inch of it. And during much of these trips in and outside of the house, the source says he's wearing surgical gloves. This is what they're observing in the surveillance. The other thing is there's a period where he comes out at 4 o'clock in the morning with two bags of garbage, walks by their own garbage and puts it in the neighbor's bins. Uh, so when they did the trash cover to recover his garbage, they took that as well. And of course, that is the search that led to the recovery of DNA, which then matched to the sheath and the knife, according to the affidavit. So again, I find that fascinating. It was 4 a.m. And then they still, you know, did the arrest and the raid or whatever you want to call it of Brian Koberger around that time. So I can't, I just, it's going to be so fascinating to hear more about that. Like, did they watch the lights and see that the lights were off the morning they decided to raid and arrest him? I just find it so, so fascinating. But yeah, I do agree. Someone said, talking about police off the cuff, I love his channel. But yeah, that it's safe to assume that they picked up the trash. And I even feel like somewhere there was an article saying that the FBI had disguised themselves as trash people. I don't know how true that is, but I do feel like I saw that somewhere. So, and I still do, like I said, I understand there's not really anything new coming out on this case. And I do want to move on to some other case discussions, other cases. But before we do, I do still want to do a live where we just randomly go back through like all my screenshots, different videos and old articles that I have saved and just kind of pull them up at random and then have a discussion off of those. So it's not, again, obviously it's not going to be anything new, but um, I do think it would be interesting just to kind of do that before we kind of, um, you know, move on. So 
I think so too, Social Butterfly. You saw that too, Insanely Confused. But they say that um, once, you know, trash is out of your house and it's in the trash bin, they don't need a warrant to pick up your trash or your neighbor's trash. They can get your trash with no warrant. Like once it's out and it's in those government issued trash bins, it's fair game. I wonder if the FBI knew from all the Koberger's phones the company was I don't know. Oh, the company was coming for New Year's. Okay. See, I hadn't heard that. Did his family have company for New Year's? And remember that there was a screenshot where somebody was working at a restaurant and his mother, Marianne Koberger, made a reservation, I believe, for either Christmas Eve or Christmas Day for dinner. And one of their requests on her reservation was to be seated in a dimly lit area. So once again, that kind of just made me think, going back to the visual snow and possible vision problems for Brian Koberger, did he prefer to be in dimly lit places? And is that why his mother asked for the restaurant to be dimly lit for their reservation? I don't know, but just something to think about. Just really, really interesting. Yeah, exactly. Yep, if they scoop the trash from the car, clean his goose is cooked. Yeah. Paul says, I think he was going to sell the Elantra. He think more like scrap it. Yeah. And then the registration is destroyed. And if he sold it to like a scrap yard, registration is destroyed and all the evidence inside it is destroyed. Because... Jennifer Koffendoffer stated that um, no matter how much he cleaned that car, in her opinion, there's likely still going to be some evidence in it, but time will tell. And a lot of people also speculate, like, again, we don't know how premeditated all of this was. A lot of people believe that he maybe brought like tarps and had that on his driver's seat that he possibly brought some time. I really believe it's very possible he was wearing some type of coveralls, gloves, maybe even little booties over his shoe. But then you got the van footprint or the possible van, but a definite footprint. But that could have been somebody who came there after Koberger. Anyway, I think it's very possible he did have um a plan and he did have a bag and took off some coverall type black outfit on his way out put it in a bag and then speeds away but who knows i hope your appointment goes well mel mac and i will see you later yeah vicky da says i think maybe one of his classmates got suspicious and called him in now another thing that i found really interesting is there was um, a news report and it stated that neighbors had said, you know, they knew Koberger had the white Elantra, but it never dawned on them to call it in. And again, could the years being the 2011 to 2013 possibly have caused some people not to call it in because it was a 2015? I don't know, but just really interesting. Okay, so let's go to this airmail article. Now, I do find this article interesting, but I definitely don't take everything it says as complete in total fact. But um, I do think it's interesting. I do think some of the stuff is embellished. There's one part that I'll get to it. But anyway. Okay, so remember part one of the airmail news article is where it was stated that the first responding officers smelled blood so strongly in the house. There was blood everywhere on the floors that the faces of the victims were 
pristine. Like their faces did not have any injuries or anything like that. Um, and that there were people gathered around and the word dead was heard. Um, so that was the first one. We went over that during a live. This is part two. And like I said, I'm not going to read all of it, but there were a couple things that um, I found interesting. Okay, so like right here, I want to know how they know this. Like is the author <laughs> privy to information that we're not to, not privy to? Because I've never really heard this before. So Michael Koberger was worried about the snow. Only days earlier... He had flown from Philadelphia to Seattle, then caught a twin-engine Embraer 170 jet for the one-hour or so shuttle flight into the frigid Pullman-Moscow Regional Airport. And now, December 13th, he was already headed back home. Only this time, it'd be a road trip. It was a fatiguing back-and-forth cross-country jaunt, especially for a 67-year-old. But Koberger had promised his son, Brian, who had nearly a month off before classes resumed at WSU, that he would accompany him on the drive back home for the Christmas break. And he was determined to make good on his pledge. It's like, okay, um, how do they know that Michael Koberger was worried about the snow? You know, like, where are they getting that from? I don't know if you guys feel the same way, but I'm just kind of like, if the they embellish a little bit too much. It just makes the whole thing kind of not credible in my opinion. Okay. So it goes on to say over the years, there had been some rough combative times between the two of them. He had even had to get Brian into rehab to kick his teenage heroin habit. But now the young man seemed on a good path. Studying for a PhD in criminal justice offered a promising career trajectory for Brian. And then it goes on to say that it must have puffed up a father with a prideful sense of parental accomplishment. After all, Michael's own life had been tarnished by not one, but two embarrassing bankruptcies. And his work days were a drudgery spent at a, as a maintenance man at the dreary high school his three children had attended. Perhaps he was even looking forward to this road trip as a way to revitalize his relationship with his son, a way to bury once and for all any lingering remnants of the old antagonisms. But now Michael, as he would later recount to an associate, was largely focused only on the forecast. So again, I wonder who this alleged associate of Michael Koberger's is, and when did the associate get this information from Michael Koberger, you know, um, just makes you wonder. All right. So here's more like talking for Michael, basically. So when it snowed in the Northwest, the accumulations were routinely measured in feet, not inches. Michael knew, and so he wanted to get going. When the weather came in, it'd be rough traveling in a seven-year-old Honda Elantra. Without four-wheel drive, you'd be slipping and sliding all over the road. So he urged Brian that they should pack up and get going now. And once again, it's like, where is this coming from? Because it's making it seem like Brian was kind of stalling to start the trip and that dad, Michael, is hurrying him up. So where's the proof of that? <laughs> you know, right. ATS News says, agree, need more details on the hearsay. Yeah. And it's like, again, all of this could be true, but how do we know that, you know, Michael Koberger is urging his son. He needs to pack up and get going now. Okay, so his son agreed. Only once they were on the road, Brian did something his father would later casually share with one of the mechanics at the garage near their home in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania, who serviced the car 
after the trip that had caught him by surprise. That was a hard sentence to read. But this is where it talks about the Colorado situation. So, but I agree. ATS News says, yeah, and these details matter. Who was in the hurry to leave? Anything he did after the crimes that happened, we need to know if it's true. I agree. Right. <laughs> Coco, Coco Mo says, okay, so let's go seven hours out of the way through Colorado. Exactly. Okay, so before Michael had headed out to Washington, he'd Googled the route back home. Once again, how do they, where is this author getting this from? The quickest, most logical drive was pretty much a straight line plowing across the country along I-90. Brian, however, button-hooked south towards Colorado where he'd picked up I-70. It seemed to make little sense. Colorado in mid-December was snow country. There was no telling what might suddenly come blowing down from the Rockies. But Brian, according to what his father told people, insisted the northern route across I-90 promised wintry conditions. Better to head away from the weather, even if it added hours or even a day to the trip. Now, I just kind of put that together this morning. I have never heard Michael Koberger speak to people. Have you guys? I mean, I know like ATS News, um, quite a few people I talk to, we follow the case, we follow the articles, we share them with each other. But have any of you guys here, Shay? Um, yeah, Shay, have you ever heard this? That Michael Koberger told people. That Brian insisted that I-90 was going to have wintry conditions. Yes, interesting that they chose to state people. Oops, sorry, I made it. Why is it not sharing anymore? There it goes. Okay. Anyway, okay, maybe it could mean people because they don't capitalize people. So maybe people, maybe I read it wrong, you guys. You guys are saying it could be people as in humans, <laughs> like friends or whatever. Okay, yeah, good point. I think you're right, Jesse. That's my fault because they don't capitalize people. So that's why I'm so glad I have you guys. So maybe they, maybe this airmail author is speaking to people, men and women, men and or women who do know Brian Koberger and who do know Michael Koberger. And maybe it's true. Michael Koberger is telling his friends or colleagues or whatever this information. Uh, okay. Yeah. So you guys are saying friends. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Jesse says he should have said source, right? Um, Tallman says, was there ice on I-90 further north? Now that I do not know. That would be interesting to look up. Like the weather conditions around December 13th. To what? Like, I think they traveled like the 13th until the 17th. 16th or 17th. I think they were back in Pennsylvania by the 17th. So, I don't know, just interesting. So, anyway, but Brian, according to what his father told people, insisted the northern route across I-90 promised wintry conditions, better to head away from the weather, even if it added hours or even a day to the trip. But yeah, Tommen, thank you so much for that, and that would be interesting to look up for sure. Okay, so maybe this is talking about the mechanic. It was said he told people at the mechanic place where they took the Elantra once they got to Pennsylvania. But the whole Colorado thing is really weird. Uh, 
Okay, now this is where he goes on to state that they lose the Elantra. So, it seemed like something more devious to the FBI. Unknown to either the father or the son, the Bureau had been determined to keep a watchful eye on the white Hyundai's track across America. Only sources in law enforcement would confide, would confide with a bristle of embarrassment not long after the car had pulled out of its space in the graduate housing parking lot in Pullman, Washington, they lost it. For several alarming hours or more, the authorities are keeping the precise details of this screw-up close to the vest. The chief suspect in a quadruple homicide that had shocked the nation had seemingly vanished. So this is making it sound like the FBI was basically following Koberger across the country and that they lost him for a little while for hours or more. So again, just interesting. And then we have the, um, we have the discrepancy. Did the FBI order the both or one of the traffic stops of Koberger in Indiana, or were they not a part of that at all? First we heard and ATS News did a live about it and got a lot of crap because of her title, but she was right. There was an article that stated that FBI ordered the stop, um, and then they changed it and said, no, they didn't. I hope you have a good rest of your day, Heavenly Clouds. Yeah, it must have been scary for his parents. Yeah, maybe he wanted to see Colorado. I mean, maybe. Okay, so the Bureau's watchers called it a hack box operation. And the jargon was a bit of an anachronism. It was a throwback to an area when G-men sporting fedoras over their brill-creamed hair would be in force on the street to monitor targets every move. A sea of hats would box the suspect in. These days, the watchers have a few more tricks at their disposal. Undercover vehicles, surveillance vans, low-flying fixed-wing planes, and that's just for starters. But the name has stuck. And the surveillance on Brian Koberger, according to published reports and interviews with officials, was hat box all the way. So, it just talks about... Um, Basically, again, like how they found him. There were whispers to local lawmen to keep eyes peeled for a white 2011 to 2016 Hyundai Elantra, and one had been caught on surveillance video dashing about the neighborhood not far from the King Road crime scene in the early morning hours immediately following the murders. And then it says, you know, Daniel Tingo, a WSU University police officer, Saw one pop up belonging to Brian Koberger, and then they mentioned the bushy eyebrows. Talks about Dylan's information she gave in the affidavit. So I just, again, I, I really will be interested to see if it turns out to be true that, you know, Brian did allegedly tell his dad, like, we're going to go through Colorado because there's supposed to be bad conditions on these roadways. Um, if that is true or not. Hey, Miranda, so good to see you. And then here it talks about, there's not, this is talks about Colorado. So there's not much to Loma, Colorado. There's just about 1,300 people scattered about on a few big farmsteads. But U.S. Route 6 passes straight through the center of the town. And eight years ago, the Colorado Department of Transportation thought it was high time to install Loma's first traffic light. They went up in 2015 at the bustling Things being relative, of course, intersection of Route 6 and Highway 139. So there was a light or a camera there.
And I wonder too, like, did they stay at any hotels or would they sleep while one was driving and then switch off? Or did they, you know, pull over to any rest stops and sleep? What all did they talk about? Obviously, it goes into this WSU emergency advisory shelter in place. And then that's obviously what they brought up when they were pulled over. But yeah, this article is weird. Same with, I mean, the first one was like, kind of how did they know all that stuff? Thank you so much, Tom N. says. I think they avoided the ice. I think the stops were them losing track of him, cell coverage. They wanted to know he was still in the car and that it was him. Yeah. And thank you for that. So you do think the stops were orchestrated by law enforcement? I tend to feel like that cannot be a coincidence and they just don't want us to know yet, you know, like they're just not ready to share that. Like it was kind of leaked out and then they were like, oh, let's act like, no, that wasn't orchestrated, you know. And this just kind of questions like, did they talk about the Moscow homicides since they were talking about the WSU situation? Um, and it does make you wonder with Brian being a PhD um, student or candidate, whatever, for criminology. And when pulled over, they bring up the WSU thing. It does make you wonder if at all it was brought up like about the quadruple homicide literally 10 minutes away from Pullman. Okay, so yeah, this talks about when they were pulled over twice within, yeah, nine minutes after they were back on the interstate, Brian once again sees flashing lights in his rear view mirror. The Kobergers were stopped again. This time it was a state trooper who pulled them over. And it does make you wonder too, like, and this kind of talks about it, um, was the suspect armed? Would someone who they believe killed four people hesitate to kill again? Would the highway cops become victims too? Would it be like an OJ chase? Or would the, you know, suspect gun the Hyundai and race away? Like if the FBI or, you know, any law enforcement was behind orchestrating these stops, you do wonder if they were worried when they made the stop, if he was going to be violent. I do too. Adrian says, I think Brian is nailed. I tend to agree. I bet he was, too. So, I don't know. Those were the biggest things um, I kind of took from this is what they claimed that his father was, you know, telling people about why they went to Colorado, why they went through Colorado, because there was supposed to be ice on their original route and or route or route, however you say it. This talks about the trash. So, I mean, it is an interesting article. It just is a lot of stuff, you know, we've heard. And I feel like a lot of it is a little bit embellished. So, I don't know. But it is it is interesting. Showing a sh knife sheath similar. And then, guys, if you guys know, is that the button snap? Is that what it would look like? I know, Tom, and you're knowledgeable about that. But, um... Is that what the button snap is on the sheath? Okay, ATS News, let me check. Yeah, Leslie says the cop about hunting a wolf was weird. Yeah, there are a few things in this that are kind of odd. And I just can't help but, you know, wonder, are we going to find out? That all this is true or not? I 
Okay, so I'm going to share this real quick. Law enforcement, okay, the law enforcement source told Fox News that the FBI surveillance team was seeking video images of Koberger as well as his hands. And then, hold on. And yeah, then they edited this out. They switched it. Yeah, here's where they said the FBI asked. Let me reshare it. One second. So, a Federal Bureau of Investigation, a FBI surveillance team, tracked Idaho quadruple murder suspect Brian Koberger and his father on a cross-country road trip from Washington State to Pennsylvania and asked Indiana police to pull him over. I really think they likely did and that this article was correct. And then once it came out, they backtracked a little bit and were like, okay, we're going to act like we didn't do that for whatever reason. But thank you for sending me that because, yeah, ATS News did a really good live all about that. And then pretty soon after her live ended, then the narrative changed and it was stating that, no, they were not, you know, asked to be pulled over. But ATS News is always very good about fact checking. And at the time she made and did her live, it indeed said the FBI orchestrated those stops. Yeah, ATS News has always take screenshots. And hello, Dave Gammon and Relinex. Good to see you. So here it says, just after midnight on December 30th, the Pennsylvania State Police Special Emergency Response Team assembled at the Gray Barn-like Troop in Barracks in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. There were about 24 of them, the usual 16 entry team members and maybe eight sharpshooters, and they were packing Glock caliber pistols were generally the weapon of choice, and the point men as a rule carried two pistols. Those who would be the first through the door were also armed with stubby black HK MP5 submachine guns. It was a brutal weapon, particularly in an enclosed space. The backups had short-barreled Remington 870 12 gauges. It was a shotgun meant for killing, not wounding. So this talks about the arrest of Koberger. And remember, guys, report stated that he spoke to law enforcement for about 5 to 15 minutes prior to asking for an attorney. And they're saying the trash turned out to be a, tre a treasure trove. There he is. He's a tall guy. Ugh. Crazy. And then remember, Jason Labar stated how he came in in the night so that the reporters wouldn't bother him. Yeah, this is crazy. All hell broke loose. A door flew off its hinges, hinges, windows shattered, explosive charges boomed. And there's the Pennsylvania attorney. So, I don't know. Just an interesting article. And then remember how uh, Leigh Barr said that Koberger was the one who kind of drafted that statement stating that he was eager to be exonerated. And then let me share this real quick. Jennifer Koffendaffer was just tweeting about the warrant. Again, we still don't know if they found the murder weapon. I've heard many people state that in this case, they don't feel like it's really going to matter if they don't have the knife. Obviously, it would help 
the prosecution's case, but um, she just says, what happened to the knife? Anxiously awaiting the search warrant return from the Pennsylvania home in hopes BK, if guilty, made a major error and kept the knife. But based on Koberger's return route, did he hide um, it on the way home? What do you think? I think he likely disposed of quite a bit of evidence during his crazy route after the homicides. I really do. I think he probably disposed of clothing, possibly shoes or covers for his shoes, gloves, and the knife. I don't think he kept that stuff. My opinion, though. But it'll be real, very interesting to see what they find. And then again, that's Kara Zana's mother stating that she does not believe in the death penalty. This was about the Ann Taylor also represented Maddie Mogan's biological father and her stepmother. Yeah. You guys are saying he a lot of you agree that he likely got rid of it. So Oh, this was something I haven't shared yet. Kaylee reported a missing person sighting in 2021. Um, I think he talks about it. And we talked about how he sought the police job. He Here's the $64,000 question. He met with the Washington or the police chief or whatever um, via Zoom and then emailed him like, hey, it was nice to meet you. We don't know if he got that job or not. We don't know either way. Archer um, and, and knew that this woman was missing, apparently thought that she saw uh, Sharon at a Walmart and knew enough to call police uh, and was in touch with police in Moscow. Uh, some of the same police officers who would eventually sadly be working on, on the homicide investigation involving her um, but, but yeah, she, she saw the woman that she thought was missing and she made the call. And it turns out that she dealt with an officer um, that is now, I think, the lead or at least one of the lead investigators in, in her murder case. Like the coincidence is just off the chain. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it is off the chain. And again, I just, I get sad about it because I just think about, again, the fact that she was trying to help someone else. I've heard from her sister. That's the kind of person she was. I mean, she went out of her way to remember the poster and then to call police. Um, and, and of course, then you just think about the way her life tragically ended. Hmm. See, I love Brian. I know she was such a good soul. And Brian even saying, you know, it makes him sad. It is sad. Like she was the type of person who cared about people. She followed true crime. We know that from her mother, who's told us that. She followed the Chronicles of Olivia channel. Again, not getting into opinions on her, but she followed her. She is a true crime channel. She followed her TikTok. Um, so just hearing that, <laughs> Caroline, hearing that, you know, she was aware and thought she recognized a woman who was missing. And like they were just saying, took the time out of her day to call it in. It's just awful. Um, hey, Angie Erickson, so good to see you. I hope that you're doing well. So, all right, guys, I think I am going to wrap this one up. We talked about a lot. Um, I know you guys are used to my lives. They're a little bit of bouncing back and forth, but I do feel like we covered a lot, had a very good discussion. And yeah, I really want to know for sure if Koberger got this job because I'm not ready to say he 100% did not get this job or that he did. I lean towards he did not, but I do think it's possible he could have had a little more access to things than we're knowing yet. Cause I know there was some report that they reached out and asked if he got the job and they stated that they would have to speak to lawyers or whatever before commenting. So I don't know. I'm open to, he could have gotten it. I know, Angie. I'm going to try to be back more. I also was telling ATS News, I kind of want to dig back into, this is a really, really hard case, but um, the Gannon stock case out of Colorado, his evil stepmother, in my opinion, Letitia Stock, is set to 
go on trial. I think it's March 20th. I'd have to double check, but I want to do at least one live kind of going back through that case. Um, it's a hard one, but I just thought it'd be an interesting case to kind of revisit before she goes to trial. I really do feel like she'll be found guilty in my opinion. So thank you, Sarah P. But yeah, thank you guys all for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, please hit the thumbs up. It really does help the channel. And again, I am going to do a live where we just go through random pictures, random videos that I have, different articles, no particular order, but just kind of go back to the beginning and look at some different things and discuss it. So Yes, we will talk again very soon. Yeah, if you would hit the thumbs up. If you want to subscribe, that would be awesome as well. If you're watching the replay, thank you for watching. And we will talk again very soon. I am going to play just some different news clips that I've gathered and uploaded to my stream yard as we go. But we will talk again very soon. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you to the mods and just everybody. I appreciate you. Bye, everybody. Jennifer, we think possibly the FBI was processing this vehicle for the evidence. So what do you think the likelihood is, even if somebody tries to clean something up, that there could be still some DNA evidence in the vehicle? I think very likely. I want to check all of those little ridges on the foot pedal that he uses. I want to check where he might open up a glove compartment, the underside of that. I want to check every nook and cranny of every piece of that vehicle because I believe there is no way that with all, all the right. blood involved in this case, he would have been able to clean that vehicle thoroughly. I think this is going to be a bit of a treasure trove for law enforcement because yeah. I don't think no matter how good of a cleaner he might think he is, yeah. assuming he committed this crime, a narcissist often believes they've done a perfect job at everything, including cleaning, but they're going to leave those little specks in nooks and crannies that they don't think about. The affidavit also said Koberger's phone pinged near the girl's home on King Road in Moscow at least 12 times in the months leading up to the murders. And close enough that he, he was touching their Wi-Fi, their, his phone was touching their Wi-Fi. Defense attorneys tell me the probable cause investigators put in their affidavit is likely just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to their evidence. ABC News learning from a law enforcement source that federal investigators observed him in Pennsylvania around 4 a.m. as he discarded garbage in his neighbor's trash bin just days before his arrest. Trash ending up being key in the case. Police linking Koberger to the murders by collecting his father's DNA from trash outside the family home and matching that to DNA they say they discovered on the button snap of a knife sheath that was on the bed next to the body of victim Madison Mogan. We have our guy, the one that committed these murders. The alleged killer, 28-year-old Brian Koberger. Chief James Fry confirming to ABC News this white Hyundai Elantra seen in surveillance video from a nearby gas station the night of the murders belongs to Koberger, saying he was the only person inside. The car now in police custody after being taken from Koberger's parents' home in Pennsylvania. According to the affidavit, a car matching Koberger's, a white Hyundai Elantra, was seen on camera at 2.53 a.m. on November 13th, leaving Pullman, heading toward Moscow. That's about a 15-minute drive. That same Elantra was picked up again at 3.26 a.m. heading west on Indian Hills Drive, then two minutes later heading west on Steiner at Highway 95. Starting at 3.29, the Elantra was seen passing the house on King Road where the murders happened three times. At 4.04, the Elantra turned around at a nearby apartment complex before going back and making a three-point turn onto Queen Road. 16 minutes later, at 4.20, Koberger's white Elantra is seen on camera speeding away from the area heading south. About an hour later, at 5.25, several traffic cameras in Pullman and on the Washington State University campus captured the Elantra returning. Twelve days later, on November 25th, the Moscow Police Department asked area law enforcement to look for a white Hyundai Elantra. Then, on November 29th, WSU police found a 2015 Hyundai Elantra registered to a student. 
28-year-old Brian Koberger, a graduate student studying criminology. His car was found about a half hour later at his WSU apartment complex in Pullman. His driver's license picture and information also matched the roommate's description of the man she saw in the house the morning of the murders. That pushed Moscow police to look into Koberger's cell phone data, a number they got after pulling him over for a traffic violation back in August, before the murders. At 2.42 a.m. on November 13th, Koberger's phone pinged at his apartment in Pullman. Five minutes later, that phone left the apartment, traveling south through Pullman before it's turned off at 2.47. The phone doesn't ping again until 4.48 on Highway 95 south of Moscow, near Blaine. It pings at several cell towers before 4.50 and 5.26 a.m., showing it traveled south on 95 to Genesee, then west to Uniontown, and then north back to Pullman where a traffic camera picked him up on Stadium Drive at 527. This wasn't the only time Koberger's phone showed up near the King Road house. A wider historical records request shows he visited the area 12 times before the murders, all but once late in the, late in the evening or early morning. And not only that, Doug, Koberger's phone pinged again hours after the murders happened near the King Road house.